name's Jason Yoder. Welcome. Whoops. My slide deck went a little fast. Welcome to how to make your code run faster. All right. There's also a little side benefit I didn't put in there. How many of you would like a raise? You've got to be kidding me. I have three people want to raise. The rest of you go. Seriously, because I'm actually going to show you how to prove to your boss how much of a raise you really deserve. But you got to stay till the end for that one. All right, so guys, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a Microsoft certified trainer, which means Microsoft says I'm a nerd with at least one social skill. That means they let me go around the world and teach a bunch of classes. PowerShell is obviously my most popular uh, class that I teach. I also do Windows Server and Client classes. So I get bombarded with a variety of questions, but I also get a unique perspective on who's out there in the ecosystem. How many of you went to college to become a programmer? Right. I would say zero. How many of you have started to become programmers? A few? Yeah, because of PowerShell, right. You know, we got these really neat commandlets that do things, but to really automate, we have to start learning how to write some code. You know, one of the cool things about the industry that we're in is that you don't have to have a college degree to run a computer network. Yes, it does help in some areas. Uh, during the, uh, we call it the Great Recession in America around, uh, you know, was about eight years ago or something, I actually noticed the dynamics of my classes changed. It wasn't just IT professionals trying to increase their skill set. It was people who have never worked in IT trying to get a skill set that's not going to be, I wouldn't say IT is recession proof, I just say it's more recession resistant, right? Yeah, I, I know a lot of people were able to keep their jobs in the IT field, but not in the factories. So one of the challenges that I have is I literally have to teach people who have never programmed in their, in their life what PowerShell is, describe the pipeline, and oh, by the way, here's how you program in five days. All right, you want a challenge? That's a challenge right there. So um, this is not for the basic user. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be showing you guys some concepts that are beyond the basics and show you a little bit of how to make things run a little faster and why we want to spend a little bit of time doing that. So here's our agenda. We're going to take a look at some programming techniques that you can leverage uh, to make things run faster. I'm going to show you some special coding tech. Yes, there's different programming coding. They're two different things. I'm going to show you how to do it. Then I'm going to show you guys how to quantify all this programming effort that you're making in the only language that your manager understands. Money, right? So I'm also going to give you the code to do this if you like. So first of all, actually, let's start off here. Let's start off with some programming techniques. So how many of you use Azure? Several of you. Okay. I am going to play a little bit with Azure here today. Now, if it looks like I'm coming off of being exceptionally angry, it's because something happened in Azure over the weekend. That totally bombed out my entire presentation. Got it fixed about 30 minutes ago. No, really, about a few weeks ago, the, this of course presentation was entirely completed. You guys are here for a reason, so of course we're going to have top-notch presentations. I tested it a few days ago. Perfect. I tested it 24 hours ago. They changed two of the commands on me. It's okay. The code I'm going to give you, and yes, I am giving you all this code at the end of the presentation, has all the updated stuff. So let's talk about some programming techniques here before we hit the Azure side. What is the difference between synchronous and asynchronous operations? Yes, I'm using asynchronous. Okay, four syllables. What's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous? Well, synchronous is, I'm sorry? That's right. So let's say we have three processes. I'm going to do one and wait. Do the other and wait. Do the other and wait. Does anybody see a little problem when it comes to time? Why not make them all happen at the same time? We do have that capability when it comes to PowerShell. We do have true parallel processing. So really quickly here, I'm going to just bring up a little function to make a little timer for us so we can see um, if there's any benefits to what we're about to do. And let me uh, split my screen here vertically. All right, real simple thing here. I'm going to just ask for BIOS information. Just a real simple job, all right? And I want to show you how to start a background job. How many of you worked with background jobs in PowerShell? Yeah, they require a little extra administrative effort because we don't receive the information until we ask for the information. That is by design. So I'm going to go ahead and do start job, and I'm going to give it a nice friendly name called BIOS test one, and we're going to run it. 
And what you can see over here is my object, my job object started. I'm going to ask to receive that object, and whoa, we have a problem. Anybody see what the problem is? Here, let me go back to the code. Anybody see it? I'm sorry? Yeah, this is not visible in the scope. Just a little caveat, if you ever use start job, it's a local job. It runs on this machine. But guess what? It's like opening a completely new instance of PowerShell. Where's that SIM class variable at? Is it here? Is it here? No. So if you have PowerShell 3, which I assume everybody by now should, but I know that's not a safe assumption. I'm going to be honest with you. Right before I flew over here, I just taught my 79th PowerShell class. Three individuals were still locked in PowerShell 2, three different companies. So actually, when I teach PowerShell, I still teach PowerShell 2 and 3 at the same time. The using scope became available to us inside of PowerShell 3. What that tells it, the machine is this. There's a variable called sim class. I'm sorry, right here on the physical machine. Transfer that variable and its entire contents to either this extra scope of memory or if you're using invoke command to those machines out there. So I'm going to go ahead and try this again and see what happens. We're going to run it. I'm going to receive it. Okay, well, that's real easy how to use a background job. And that kind of sets us up here for what I'm about to show you in Azure. I hope I remember to authenticate inside of Azure. I may have to blink the screen in a second. Yeah, because otherwise they're going to see all my Azure stuff. All right, so here's the deal. With Azure, um, you can actually do things at the same time. You see, when I teach in a Microsoft class, I got the advantage of having... How, where's the camera at? Okay. Couldn't see where to stand. All right, so I have the advantage of using Microsoft's labs. They're all created. It's all done for me. What if I don't do a Microsoft class, one of my own? I have to create my own environment, right? So I have a choice. I can go through the airport lugging crates of laptops that I'd have to buy, or I can do it all in Azure. But if you have virtual machines running in Azure, what's happening? I'll give you a hint. It's costing you money, isn't it? So the design I had to put into this product is this. When I'm ready to build the class, I want to do this and let it go. And it works. It does a lot of asynchronous jobs. Here's the deal. To do a fully deployed lab, it takes about 55 minutes per lab. I usually have to scale it out to at least 20 labs. Anybody want to do the math on that? Almost an entire day. Guess how long it takes me to build all 20 to whatever labs? About 50 minutes because of what I'm about to show you here. So I'm going to go ahead and go into Azure. And real quick, I just want to make sure that I properly authenticated into Azure. Let's see. Get Azure RM resource. Let's see. If it comes up with data, then we know we're good. Oh, come on, tab complete. Just updated all of my Azure modules. So this is going to be fun. There we go. Let's see. If it comes up, then we're good. Yep, we're good. Okay, so let's give this a try. So here in the code, and again, this is the exact code that's going to be on the download side. You can see that you do need to put your Azure subscription in here. Sorry, I'm not giving you mine. All right. All right, once that's done, I need to save my Azure profile to disk because the reason is, is that authenticated session is here. I'm about to start a background job. Guess what? It's not there. So I commit it. The context, and this is one of the new commands that Microsoft changed on us just in the last few days. There we go. So I went ahead and saved it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build some Azure resource groups, but I'm going to do it synchronously. I'm going to do only three of them, and we're going to let it roll, and you're going to see what's happening in the background. What's happening is I'm creating a container inside of Azure for each of the individual labs. It took about seven seconds for that, and I know this is, I chose a few things that are not going to take a long time. I'm going to do the same thing asynchronously. And let me uh, make sure I select everything. This is not going to yield a lot of extra time. See, now I'm worried that they just changed the commandlets on me again. There we go. Ten seconds. We didn't really get anything out of that, did we? This was a very fast operation. Let's uh, jump over here to Azure. Oh, reload. Let's jump over here to Azure just to see. Uh-oh. 
Well, there they are. One, these are the first three. These were the second three that were created using that procedure. Let's do something that takes a little bit longer. What I'm going to do is tell it to build a storage account both synchronously and asynchronously at the same time. The reason I'm going to do this is because now I have to fill the next two minutes with idle conversation. Seriously, this process does take a little while. What's a storage account do in Azure? Remember, I'm building virtual machines. No one wants to go on the microphone, do they? Well, I have to have some place to store those virtual hard drives, don't I? So the thing is, is that I need to make these labs completely isolated from each other because you just don't know when you're going to get somebody who wants to play with somebody else's labs, right? That's why I have these in different resource groups. They're isolated. They can't touch each other. So each one needs their own individualized storage account. What you're seeing happening up here are the synchronous operations being performed. Let me move this over here. Remember, the synchronous operations I have running first. I have one created. You can tell this process is going to take quite some time. Let's go over here to Azure. We're going to take a look at the... Do, 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 where are we at? There it is. Well, I've got two of the six. Remember, the first three are going to be done synchronously, but the last three are going to be completed asynchronously. And then, of course, it's going to show us the time. You know, I probably should have did that, had these built in Europe as opposed to the Western United States. Don't like waiting, do you? We're going to come back to this in just a second. Don't worry. In about a minute, this will be done. And it'll show us the difference in time between synchronous and asynchronous. I think you all are getting the idea. This takes a while, doesn't it? So... Let's take a look at some coding techniques that you can use. What are these? I'm sorry? Well, not really for each. It could be used in it if you're doing for each object inside the PowerShell pipeline. These are our temporary variables. And yes, I do put both the PowerShell 2 and the PowerShell 3 version up there. The reason is people ask me, is either one of these faster? Well, let's see. So... By the way, guys, I'm also an MVP for Sapien, so at some point in this conference, I actually need to bring up their software. And here we go. I know. Shameless plug, right? Here we go. So I'm going to go ahead and execute a few test runs of which one of these is actually faster. And, well, actually, that's usually evenly distributed. Let's keep doing it a few times. These are being done, um, I believe these are mil average milliseconds for uh, 10. Each one of these runs, I believe, is 10 different attempts and we're running it 10 times, you can see it's pretty evenly distributed. In essence, guys, I can't find a performance difference between them. Now, I have a tendency of still using dollar sign underscore when I'm using for each object. Uh, the reason is, is I publish a lot of stuff and I got to watch how much room is on the screen. But the other thing you should realize is this. If you have an investment in any scripts that uses that dollar sign underscore, you don't have to go through and tell them to change the dollar sign PS item. You're not going to get any performance increase. So don't bother. Keep using what you've got so far. Let's jump over real quick. Ah, there we go. Huh. So it's telling me that to do a synchronous operation of three storage account builds took 110 seconds and asynchronous took half that amount of time. Right there, we're seeing some time savings, aren't we? Now, particularly if this is a critical operation where money is waiting for a task to be completed, when does money start flowing? Is synchronous or asynchronous? Yeah, asynchronous. Something to take a look at. All right. So, another one we can try playing with here. Pipeline versus dot notation. What do I mean by pipeline versus dot notation? I'm sorry? Well, it's essentially, are we going to use the PowerShell pipeline? Who uses the pipeline? It better be everyone here. Yeah. Okay, so let's kind of think about the pipeline here just a second. Because we are not programmers, there is a lot of action happening in the background to make that pipeline work. You know, the commandlets talk to each other, right? Each one on every side of that pipe, they talk to each other so that they can understand when I'm done processing, you give me something else. Oh, wait, you have nothing else to give me? Okay, hey, I'm done. I mean, they are literally talking to each other. Would you guys like to program that? No. 
So that's one of the beauties behind PowerShells. There is a lot of automation, but we have to watch the level of automation because it can come at a performance hit. Let's go ahead and uh, try the next one here. Pipeline versus dot notation. So here what I did is I grabbed a whole bunch of files. Now you're not gonna see the output, but I grabbed a whole bunch of files and I piped it to uh, select object. And I'm t asking it to expand the property called name. And then I did a final one out null so we don't get a bunch of garbage. The second one, however, I dotted out or Pascal notation or whatever you wanna call this. Instead of using the pipeline, I expanded the value of that variable. And you can see a significant difference in processing time. I'm not saying the PowerShell pipeline is bad. It is really awesome. I'm just saying though, that there are ways that we can optimize our code that if we can avoid using the pipeline. There's no reason, as you can see right here, we can't continue piping. It works. Let's go jump back over here to this code. This is where things are gonna get a little complex. So what I'm gonna do is run that exact same piece of code, but this time I'm only gonna ask for one file because I wanna only have one iteration of data on the screen right now. So we're gonna take a look at what happens just with the parameter binding alone. Now this, I'm using what's called trace command. We use it when we're trying to debug the PowerShell pipeline. And this is gonna be pretty cryptic stuff. We're not really concerned about exactly what it's doing, but I wanted you to see that there is stuff happening in the background. Now let's run the same command that was with the pipeline. Here's the same command without the pipeline. Hmm, a little different there, isn't it? Now there's a lot of things that we can do with uh, tracing our commands. I'm gonna go ahead and list all the sources. I only used one. So what I'm gonna do is grab all the sources and let's see truly what's happening behind the screen. Again, this first one is gonna be with the PowerShell pipeline and it is slightly larger. A lot of work being done for you. Again, this is good guys, this is very good. Otherwise, you would have to do this work. Here is the same thing when you're not using the pipeline. There is some activity happening in the background, but only to get the information out to the screen. So again, if you can avoid using the PowerShell pipeline, if time matters, this will actually save you a little bit of time. How about this one? For each or for each object. And I'm not talking about the alias for for each object. Isn't that neat? We have a, command, a structural command called for each. We have a PowerShell pipeline commandlet called for each object who happens to have an alias of for each. No one's gonna get confused by this, right? Exactly, okay. So uh, they are used in two different places. They literally do the same thing, one in the pipeline, one not. So the question is, which one is actually faster? So, let's see. Oh, by the way, guys, the source code for this little GUI I made, it's in the download. So let's see, for each versus for each object. So let's see what happens. Wow, staying outside the pipeline has a little bit of a performance advantage, doesn't it? Not always appropriate in every situation, but if it is, you can see right there how to make things go a little bit faster. I think I've got, oop. Yes, provided you have enough RAM. Now, of course, the uh, scale, we're gonna see the scale of things when we go to how many objects we're working with. But yeah, there is the advantage where the PowerShell pipeline does one at a time. For each, we had to put it into an array. So yes, there is a memory requirement. How about this? Anybody use like or equal? These comparison operators, they solve a lot of problems really fast for you. But let's see which one of these are fast. They do almost the exact same thing. But what, what's the difference between them? I, yeah, sorry? The asterisk, the wild card characters. Of course, the asterisk is an unknown number of characters. A question mark in PowerShell is a single unknown character. But like can use wild cards, equal cannot. So the thing is though that like can also act, uh, act as an equal. Should you use it? I don't know, let's find out. Let's see, I think I skipped a few there. Execute, let's see what happens. Huh, equal significantly faster. 
So we need to pay attention to what types of comparison operators that we are actually using because some of them will function faster. All right, let's take a look at, yes. I'm sorry? How match? Do I have a match in here? I didn't put a match. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you what, at the end, you like to use match? Okay, I'll tell you what here, at the end, before we break off, let's program a match in there, okay? I don't want to don't want to mess up the code while we're uh, in session, but yeah, we'll try it right before we break off. Cool. Hmm. There's going to be a lot of work in the background on that one because it has to search strings to do that. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, do I actually have one already built in here? No, that might be a different presentation. I'll tell you, hang tight afterwards, we'll answer that question, okay? All right, so we can see that this one has a performance advantage on it. So what about these other ones? And I want to see if I accidentally went too far. Because I noticed I skipped a few there in my... Yeah, well, we'll just go back and do them. So let's take a look at this one. How about where object versus the where method? Now, how many of you are familiar with the where method? Now, some of you are, okay. So, where object is our filter. Now, I always tell people, if you're going to use where object, look at the commandlet before it. Does that commandlet have the ability to self-filter itself? For anything it doesn't have the ability to do, yeah, that's where where object's going to come into play. But it comes at a little bit of a cost. So, we have this thing that's called the where method. And let me actually jump over here. Thanks for the quick little copy and paste job. I hope I didn't overwrite a particular piece of code. Or I just didn't load it up, one of the two, coding. Yep, guys, I'll add in an extra piece of code into this, but it looks like I hit the overwrite, because I'm not kidding you, over lunch, I finally fixed the problem that was caused in Azure. So I do a quick little recode. Um, let's go ahead and run this and show you the difference. And you can kind of see the syntax right here on how to do the where method. You can see I'm running get process. When you put an ampersand or an at symbol in front of it, surrounded by parentheses and dot, you of course get what some of the members, the properties, the methods of that particular object. And this, did I run this? Yeah, it's going. And what happens is, is that there's now a where method. There we go. So I ran this thing three different times. There's an advanced, a basic syntax that we gained with PowerShell 3. There's an advanced syntax we've had since PowerShell 2. And then, of course, there's the method. Now, that basic one actually caught up with it. Let's run it one more time. So the basic syntax, we don't use a script block. It can only do one thing. You just give it the name of a property and what you're going to match it against. In the advanced syntax, of course, we can do multiple operations. We can do multiple comparisons. We can use logical operators. We can do a lot more. All three of these are essentially doing the exact same thing, but just doing different methodology. Let's see if we get a little solid answer. Last time, the method one. There we go, a little bit out there. Now remember, I am running multiple virtual machines right now, so anything could slightly slow off this information when you're running in milliseconds. But I think we can see Methods, when you use those methods, they run faster. Now don't forget there's also a for each method. And again, all we're doing here is just grabbing a lot of files. We're just simply executing the method to change into uppercase, but we're doing it through different ways. The first is the basic syntax, the second, the advanced, and you can see we have a performance increase in the third. Now, the neat thing I want you guys to start pulling from this as we continue on is don't be a creature of habit. How many of you, once you find a way to do something, you stick to it? Oh, come on, be honest. I want to be honest, all right? I do the same thing too. Yeah, and you know what? One of the reasons why that every once in a while, some certain functionality or procedure would have you starts going faster than others is because Microsoft makes changes. Go ahead. Yeah, and yeah, originally this code was written to be done in the ISC, but to display it with the colorization was causing some issues, so I switched over to here. The out and all would have prevented us from seeing a bunch of stuff. Anytime you write something to the screen, you just slowed things down big time. 
So this would prevent it from being written to the screen during these demonstrations. So it's, I'm sorry. Yeah, but piping it prevented would have prevented a display from being created. Oh, I see. So just send it to a variable. Okay, that would be yes, that would be faster. See, I just learned something. But don't be confined to what you've been doing. Keep your eyes open. And in this case, when I get pointed out to me that there are ways to do things faster. All right. So again, Microsoft does tweak with its its code. Now this is using some .NET stuff. When they tweak it, they might make it faster. So you just don't know. It's some. I was at the um, Singapore summit. And I cannot remember what it was the question on, but uh, they're showing that certain things have become faster because of changes in the .NET framework. So keep your eyes open for faster methods. All right. Now, how many of you actually play around with .NET at all? The .NET objects. Few of you? Okay. It's really cool stuff, guys. Seriously. So the PowerShell commandlets give you these objects, right? So we get these objects. They have properties. They have methods. They have events. Those are the object members. Well, guess what? Same thing when you play with the .NET um, objects. The thing is, though, is that what we get in PowerShell isn't everything that you can have access to. So sometimes if we look at .NET and use the raw .NET objects, they come with additional functionality that's faster than we get inside of PowerShell. So let's take a look at something here. Arrays method versus sort object. If you take a look at the array object, it has a method called sort. We have a command called sort object. Let's see what happens here. Slightly faster. All right. So yeah, so I got some hedge. Oh, that one is actually showing some speed difference, isn't it? What's that again? All right. Let's recode it then. Now, I don't know what the exact effect will be. Let's try it. So that was test number seven. As soon as this guy decides to egg. Uh, it's still calculating. Give it a second. There we go. So let's go down in the code to number seven, which is our output. Here's where things were programmed in, and let's see how we're doing this one. So you guys want me to do it this way, correct? All right, let's see what happens. Now, this was hard-coded, by the way. That's why it hasn't changed. Method. <laughs> Good catch. But I think we're still pretty significant on that side. Satisfied with that one? All right. So again, keep your eyes open on things. So how about this one here? Um, anybody read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea? Oh, I know. It's not a technical manual anymore, is it? Yeah, it's actually my favorite book by Jules Verne. So I thought it would be kind of fun to play around with some um, another object on actually reading it. Now, get content is going to be our commandlet to read a text file. Now, when I run this, uh, there's what? Now, this particular download I took, each paragraph was a single line. So there's 12, over 12,000 paragraphs containing multiple sentences in here. So I was wondering which one's going to be faster. So let's take a look. When we use the system IO stream reader, I actually found two ways that we could read this entire file in. Read to N and read to N asynchronous. Sound familiar from earlier in the presentation? Yeah, and then of course we had get content. There was a slight difference in being able to read. Again, I am iterating through multiple iterations here on these. But you can see that we had a difference here when we did asynchronous operations. Now again, whatever's happening on my processor in the background can have an effect. I'm going to go ahead and run this again to see if one of these other two actually, for whatever iteration, whatever reason, go faster. Did you run? Yeah, yep, it's running. Tell so it's a big file, can't you? There we go. No, not a big difference there, is there? 
So again, don't be locked into just the PowerShell command that you might find things. Oh, I accidentally hit it again. You might find some objects that will help things make, a go, make things go a little bit faster. Now let's see. Come on. I didn't put a kill switch on this thing when I programmed it. All right. Contains. How about one of those comparison operators? Contains versus a contains method. What does contains do for you? That's correct. Now, I rigged this one deliberately not to find a match to the end of the array. Okay? So the array just simply contains 1 through uh, 9,999. I'm asking it, does it contain a test value, which is 9998? And you can see when we're using the method as opposed to the operator, yeah, we do get a performance increase. Now, again, we're talking in milliseconds, so we have to scale things out to how many of you work with more than one object? That should be everybody in the room, by the way. All right, if you're working with just one object and making six figures, I want your job. All right. Let's take a look at a few other things here. Let's try avoiding reading the same data multiple times. Oh, of course, that's going to be one I killed, did it? Nope, there it is. So this one is, okay, again, this one is not realistic. It's just for example, in this case, I'm using contains to look for two different files, but twice, twice I'm reading the same set of data. This is going to take a little time. True, it just found one. Found the second. Now let's do that again, starting from scratch, but this time we're going to save it into a variable. Now, yes, you do have to have the RAM for this, but I'm not going to read it. Oh, those truths came up kind of fast. Let's see how fast they went. This is going to be in seconds. A little bit faster that way. Now I show this to you because one of the things I do in my PowerShell classes on Friday, and this is not listed in the official Microsoft version, um, is that I do what's called Project Day. I invite people to bring in a simple thing they want to try inside of our test environment, and then of course I coach them, and I don't do it, I coach them, and then they go home. Uh, taking that project with them. It makes the class more valuable to them because the entire week they're looking on how to finish that project. This is a problem I see a lot. They go through the same data set reading from disk multiple times. Anytime you read, yeah, you're shaking your head, you know what I'm talking about. Reading from disk, taking it down, downloading it from the internet. If it's the same data set, why are you doing it multiple times? Unless, of course, for some reason, in the next few milliseconds, that data is going to change. So again, that's one of the common programming mistakes that I find that people make when they're not taking a good look at their code. So, actually, how much data was in those arrays? 25,000 records. You guys know you can iterate through these with the... Uh, with the uh, array, and, uh, array syntax, right? You can find the first and the end. Technically, we don't really care too much in PowerShell because our commandlets are designed to work with an unknown number of objects. So is for each object as well. All right, so we took a look at a few different things. I did not scroll through my slide deck. Sorry about that. All right, so remember, stay away from those disk IOs as much as you can. If you're going to read from them, do it once if it's feasible, but if there's a chance during the course of the script running, a change that you need to be made aware of, then yes, you have to go back to disk. Keep on the synchronous versus asynchronous options. Remember, asynchronous generally is faster. Yes, it does take extra management because you have to ask for the information. Anybody do scheduled jobs in PowerShell? Okay, good. What's the big advantage with scheduled jobs over background jobs? I'm sorry? Yeah, they run during the night. <laughs> okay, so here's a bit. <coughs> Excuse me. This is an occupational hazard when you start coughing. Um, here's a big difference between the two. On a background job, I can't close PowerShell. What happens if I close it? Yeah, it's gone. Memory destroyed. That's a good thing, right? Otherwise, you and I have to worry about memory management. We'd have to clean up the mess after ourselves. Um, anybody have a phone that crashes, gets really slow, then crashes? 
It's called a memory leak. Somebody forgot to clean up memory. You and I don't have to worry about that. Now, with a scheduled job, it is a background job with a difference. On the machine that runs it, it commits the data to disk. Big advantage there. So think about that. If you need to have something that runs in the middle of the night and you really don't want to be at work to trigger it, put it as a scheduled job. Now you can claim that information later on. All right. Uh, remember, whenever you use those background jobs, it is a completely separate scope of memory. Any information that my brain has here, I need to make sure I pass over. Anybody, and don't be embarrassed. It's okay, guys. Anybody here using PowerShell 2? Okay, those are some, sometimes, at least there's some brave, those are some brave individuals. All right, guys, so which, remember what you're looking for, you can't use that using scope. On start job and also invoke command, there is a parameter called argument list. You list your variables in the order you want to pass them. Inside the script block, keyword param, inside parentheses, list the variables in the same order. You can have, you can rename them. So the first variable in the argument list is A, and then the parameter block, the last one's A. They don't go that way, folks, okay? First to first, second to second. Also, working with Azure, keep that in mind because it's the cloud. Things do take time. Go ahead. No, I've never tried that. Because I'll be honest with you, once I discovered it, I stopped using the argument list just for programming. Um, tell you who else was, who else was I going to work with after class here after after class after we're done? Who had that idea we were going to try? The idea is was it yours? Okay, why don't you two get together with me right afterwards here, and we'll give it a try. Okay, all right, because I think I have some pre-made code here that would help us test it out. So the difference in speed, we'll just inject it and see what happens. Now, why would speed be important to you? It's faster. I'm sorry. Yeah, especially when you're acquiring a lot of objects. But, um, you know, I have a tendency of looking at things from the business perspective. How many of you work in an environment of infinite financial resources? You work for the United States government, don't you? <laughs> You know how they get their infinite financial resources? They raise my taxes. Okay. So, yeah, that's one of the problems we work in. And um, in practice, I've had a lot of issues with uh, the managers of organizations not truly really understanding what the true cost of IT is. And let's face it, if they can't see it, they're not going to purchase it, right? Has any of you been ridiculed, criticized, or scorned by your immediate manager because you spend a lot of time writing PowerShell code and not clicking? You, yeah, you do? Yeah. I did. Okay, so this is what I did because let me tell you, we were in an environment where um, we had an, we were increasing. We were going international, but we were not going to hire any additional IT staff. It was to the point where, um, you know, it's like when you don't go home at night. That was becoming my life. So I started investing heavily in automation. And um, I was ridiculed quite heavily and threatened, actually, um, it, you know, into a few shouting matches. Well, this is what happened at my evaluation. So I handed over to my boss my input. So what I've done for the last year, oh, Jason, this is great. I guess you're doing okay. I then handed him two more years of work. He asked me, what's this? I said, those are the two employees you didn't hire this year because their jobs are automated. By the way, the parts of your job I have not turned back over to you is also automated as well. Now, I don't suggest being belligerent. That might not go over well, but I was also planning on leaving the company the next month. But anyhow, what? Come on. I'm not going to be treated that way. So, guys, I'm going to add a little extra here that was not in the actual promo for this, uh, this particular – I keep calling it a class because I'm used to being in classes – this particular session. I want to show you some code. I know, Tom, you've seen this before. So this is my two-hour presentation for you crammed down into about five minutes. I'm going to share with you just a little hint on how to financially prove to your organization what you're saving them. All right? So – Defining time in terms of money. So I have a couple of objects and a couple of measurements here. Let's say you've got a very advanced running script and you're able to use some techniques, maybe accelerated per object by, I don't know, a quarter of a second. Doesn't sound like much, but if it's over 10,000 objects, it goes 41 minutes faster. The reason why we want to speed things up here is that I'm going to write PowerShell, not just for me, 
but I'm going to be writing it for other people, non-technical users, because let's face it, they do repetitive activities as well, right? All right, let me give you an example. Our receptionist, she was in charge of maintaining cell phone numbers on a specific spreadsheet. Doesn't sound like much, right? We had a lot of salesmen, and I do not understand why our salesmen change phone numbers every couple months. I mean, do you think that's, you would want your clients to get a whole, I have no idea why. Anyhow, this was a very manual operation. So what Rose and I did is we agreed to a certain format. Um, on the spreadsheet because she was also required to update it in Active Directory, which is okay. I could delegate her the rights to just update that field, but can you see how this is becoming ridiculously cumbersome? So this is what we did. We agreed on how the format of her spreadsheet would look like. At night, PowerShell runs and updates Active Directory. Doesn't sound like much, right? Saved her 30 minutes a week. So how much time does that quantify out here? Let's see. So 30 minutes and, oh, come on now. Number lock. There you go. 30 minutes over the course of 52 weeks. There are 60 minutes per hour, 26 hours. Again, you might not think that's a lot, but what could, that's over three days of work. So what can you do with three extra days of work other than take a vacation? It gets better. So let's take a look at how we can quantify out to our employers the value that you have, the skill set that you have. So we want to make sure, of course, that when it comes to pink slips, in America, we call the pink slip, you're fired, okay? Uh, we want to make sure that you don't get it. We want to make sure that you deserve, that you get every raise and bonus that you deserve. And the thing is, is that you have to quantify this out to make them understand. Now, I'm a chief petty officer in the United States Navy. On my flight home, guess what I'm doing? Evaluations. And if my people don't quantify what they've done, they don't get good marks. The quantification is needed, and that's one of the things that we're going to put into our scripts. We're going to do. We're going to add a little extra function, and all we have to do is essentially tell it how much time this script saved every time it's ran. We're going to put a share on a network drive, and of course, we do have to allow our users to write to this. I'm sorry, it's the only way to get it to work, and then we'll append a CSV file every time that script is ran. At the end of the year, you're going to run another command from the module that I'm going to put up on the share drive for you. It's going to tell you exactly how much time was saved. Now, let me put a little caution out here. You have to actually tell it how much time it saves. It doesn't know. When you do this, though, don't exaggerate the numbers. There is no reason to ever exaggerate how much time I just saved rows because every time that it runs, it gets more and more and more time. And, of course, if you ever exaggerate and you're caught, guess what happens? What I'm about to show you will be worthless. They'll never trust your numbers. So let's play around a little bit. We're going to ask a few questions. Who, what, where, when, and how much time saved in seconds. I'm about out, aren't I? How much time saved in seconds we're going to be able to save. So let me jump over here. And we're going to open up my quantification code. And also real quickly, because I'm going to have to execute this stuff fast. Uh... Did I pull that off the wrong one? Well, we'll see. I'm going to go ahead and run this little program here. This actually, again, is a normally a two-hour presentation. These are some things that we were doing in our actual PowerShell class. And when they were applied to their environments, how much time they actually saved. I'm going to go ahead and tell this thing to run all of them. All right. So now, let me see here. Let's, uh, let me make sure this entire module's in memory before I try this. Get quantification. Oh, I'm sorry, measure. There is a help file for this, guys, and I'm about out of time. It's not going to be able to go through every little instance of this. But what did I do? Input. Whoops, I actually needed to provide an object to it, didn't I? Oh, I need to read the help file. Where did I put it? Import. Import. CSV. The path to the CSV. I got so many modules built into this thing right now. The tab completion gets a little slow. CSV. Let's make sure this works. There it is. There's the actual file that's just created with the quantification data. I'm going to measure quantification out. And again, there are switched parameters on this to, do, to separate it by maybe user, by script, what have you. 
In this case, it's just going to do the basic report of how much time when all those scripts were executed in the intended environment. We saved, what was it? Do do average work days. I don't think I had enough. I didn't do the entire thing, did I? Total days saved 312 days just from those seven scripts being ran in their intended environments. And I did ask when we create them how many. Oh, we killed Dorothy. We're fine. Oh, really? Okay, good. And I just rushed it. All right. So in the actual environment, I ask them how often it's going to be ran. How many clients or objects are we going against? How often? And that's where these other numbers. That's not the number I want. There we go. That's how we got these numbers. Some of them were just going to be ran once per week. Some we're just going to be ran once, period. But when quantified out to the number of objects, significant time savings. So what you can do with that file, if you're really bold, it doesn't show any money, does it? So you can make prior arrangements with your immediate supervisor in HR because you can actually turn over that CSV file because, you know, in Excel. And it actually shows the users whose time was saved. If HR is willing, um, they can literally put in there the cost of that user per hour. Multiply it out by how many hours, crunch them all down into a singular number, and hand, privately hand that over to your manager. There is no way your manager can decode that to figure out who makes what. But in the end, it shows you how much money you saved. Um, roughly guessing based on um, people's job offers. Remember, I saved two full salary employees. Those salary employees, when we figured it out, roughly... Um, with insurance costs, those were within the six figures per employee. So imagine what would happen to my bonus offer after that. I'm sorry? Absolutely, I left the company. But anyhow, <laughs> however, people have uh, tried this before, and yes, it has yielded positive results because financially you can prove how much money your skill set is now worth to the company. Will you become millionaires? No, um, but it might help out in the long run. All right, other than the two people I'm about to meet here privately, do we have any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry? I haven't tried that one out. So for each, mine, uh, what's the parameter name? Oh, Parallel. I've never tried that one, to be honest with you. Hey, we got another one to play with. All right, what else? No, I have three people. It's okay, this is my last session today. All right, guys. Well, I hope this helped you out now for the stuff you've been waiting for patiently. Oh, real quickly, I got to do the closing slides. Yeah, yeah. Okay, hey, if you're interested, follow me on Twitter. If my blog updates, it gets updated on the Twitter handle. If you, I know all of you are experts in PowerShell, but if you have staff that needs to become experts, feel free to give me a call. We can make arrangements. I've taught all over the world, so I know how to come over here. One of our sponsors for this event, Riley Media, I do have an advanced PowerShell scripting training video series with them. Ignore the fact we still called it Windows Server 8. That's when we actually deployed it out. But it does have the PowerShell code to build your own sandbox. And that's in the free section of that. And also, if you would like to download all the code that I just had up there, right there's the link. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Mm -hmm.